Welcome to our continuing discussion on political cartoons and their evolution through Europe. Previously, we'd looked at comics and cartooning as basically the propaganda of the rich, uh, people who could afford to make giant tapestries and really cool hieroglyphs and, and big art. We did look at graffiti, so the commonplace art as well. With the expansion of the middle class in the Enlightenment, we could see some new art coming out, these juxtaposed paintings of Hogarth. While juxtaposition didn't quite stick, they did really run with this idea of caricature. And at that same time, we had a new thing coming out, newspapers. So this was the idea that people wanted information on a weekly or even daily basis. Uh, some newspapers had three editions a day, your morning edition, your daily edition, and your evening edition. With all of that need for material, uh, people love pictures, and so cartooning became a big deal. One of the first major cartoonists was Mr. Jim Gilray. So he would draw these caricatures and famous things and make commentary on political ideas of the day, just like we see in political cartoons today. Here's an example from the 1790s. So today we have anti-vaxxers who are opposed to vaccinations, but that's nothing new. Uh, since the very beginning, when Edward Jenner was producing vaccines for smallpox, uh, there were people who were saying, why would you do this? Uh, don't inject disease into your body. Just don't get sick in the first place. So logically, that may not be the strongest uh, argument as you look at the actual details and the evidence and see people who get cowpox don't get smallpox, so a disease that is much, much less deadly. Why wouldn't you carry through on that? But you can have a lot of pathos with that. And pathos, that uh, appeal to emotions, is very strong through images, which translates very strong into uh, political cartoons. So here we have uh, the cowpox. So, or the wonderful effects of the new inoculation, brought to you by the Anti-Vaccine Society. So it's strange how the more things change, the more they stay the same. Reading the cartoon from left to right, uh, we see the people coming into the room. You get your quick anesthetic, uh, which is, of course, just rum. And this is accurate. What Dr. Edward Jenner would do is you cut an X on your arm, and they would get this donated pus of cowpox, and they'd rub it in real good, and then you get cowpox. Uh, and after a couple weeks, you'd be just fine and you'd never have to worry about smallpox. But uh, to take into gargantuan proportions this caricature, we have all these people uh, catching what he's calling cowpox. We have this guy uh, with bulls busting out of his body. This lady's got horns growing on her head and this guy's got a nose and so forth. So it's a very strong pathos, but ultimately logically ridiculous. Even so, a lot of people bought into this and still do to this day. So political cartoons were getting a pretty good uh, leg up and kind of attention through the world. And then we had the Napoleonic Wars. So uh, revolution in France kicked out the aristocracy. It turned out the uh, revolutionary government wasn't super great. And so ultimately it would be overthrown by this uh, young Corsican general. Uh, named Napoleon, and Napoleon being a warrior really continued the conquest of all throughout Europe. Uh, on the home front, if you're going to want to keep people interested in fighting this guy, you're going to have to use a lot of propaganda, which to this day we always talk about how Napoleon's super short, right? We have him portrayed by uh, very small people. But uh, more accurately, he wasn't that short. He's about 5'6", you know, Tom Cruise height. Uh, not terribly short, especially for a uh, protein-poor diet like they would have had in those days. However, during the translation of French inches and uh, British inches, they made him out to be a lot shorter, and it just stuck, right? Something simple people can get their minds around, and so that would be portrayed not only in everyday conversation, but of course also in your political cartoons. Here we have one of those political cartoons from Gilray uh, criticizing the separation of the earth. So we have uh, William Pitt the Younger, the Prime Minister of Britain at the time, uh, who was trying to make a peace treaty so that they could kind of catch their breath, invest resources in Spain, and fight against uh, Napoleon. Uh, he, as Gilray, was not much of a fan of this idea, so he called it uh, the plum pudding in danger, or the state epicure taking on with petite support. So they've got this big plum pudding representing the globe, and they're cutting it into pieces, 
which is really not a good way to do your globes. Ultimately, uh, more and more political cartoons would jump in, uh, which this is Mr. Cruikshank, so who uh, kind of took over as Gilray peaked in his uh, performance and, and retired in the 1810s. Uh, Gilray got going about 1800 and would go on for decades into the 1830s and 40s. Here's one of his early comics, Fighting for the Dunghill, or Jack Tar Settling Bonaparte. So here we have Bonaparte, and he's all torn up, and he's got this big punch from Nelson, and he's bleeding out his nose, and here's uh, Jack Tar, the, one of the representations of Britain, punching him and knocking him off the globe. So victory, which caused a lot of political cartoonists to retire, because after you defeat Napoleon, what are you going to do? So... Uh, Gilray did retire, but Cruikshank was pretty young and had a lot more to do, and he turned back to critiquing the things at the time. So, for example, here we have the umbrella being created recently, and uh, kind of poking fun at this lady here, saying, The umbrella, they make these here things sadly too small for good-sized people. I'll be hanged if I aren't wet as muck. Uh, which, of course, she's wearing the, the stylish petite umbrella instead of a uh, very useful one, as we see this guy in the background. So it's much more... Uh, her silliness rather than uh, the uselessness of the new invention. We'd see lots of caricatures, such as these representations of people all throughout Europe, which uh, if it were the 1820s, we would all know who these various uh, leaders and dukes and everybody are. Uh, right now, we can just kind of poke fun at people getting stuck in doorways and guys stepping on this lady's dress and kind of silliness. So th same thing you'd see in variety shows making fun of whatever Hollywood star today. Cruikshank did keep up a kind of guide of the styles of the time, which he called the monstrosities. And what he would do is draw what is coming into fashion. So here in 1819 and 1820, women are wearing a lot more petticoats. And here we just have petticoats stacked on petticoats stacked on petticoats to the point of ridiculousness. And guys are wearing these newfangled top hats. So instead of a hat that actually uh, has a brim or covers your head, it just kind of sits on the top. Here are some further monstrosities, which going into 1821, we have very skinny uh, waists on everybody. Very much the style of the time. Look how long men's pants are getting. Uh, and these top hats are continuing to expand in, in popularity and really big overcoats, so which were popular in the 1920s as well. So maybe we'll see a big push in overcoats in the 2020s. Uh, one final thing about Cruikshank, uh, he often did the illustrations for his good buddy, Charles Dickens, in a lot of his books. So just kind of a little interesting crossover on how historical people so often knew each other. Meanwhile, over in France, uh, we have this guy, uh, Mr. Daumier. So much like Britain was doing its political cartoons, making fun of the people at the time and criticizing leaders in kind of a joking fashion, uh, he'd wanted to do the same thing in France, which didn't quite work out. Uh, he and a group of artists in 1830s started up La Caricature. This was a, a collection of cartoons, uh, funny essays, articles, just kind of cool stuff of what's going on in the day. Uh, politics, morality, and literature. So in there, he would draw comics such as The New King Who Has Come In after... Uh, Napoleon was kicked out. They brought in a new king, and that didn't work out, so that king got flipped over to another king, and the republic was for a while. All the stuff that they were talking about in Les Miserables. But with the new king, Louis-Philippe, uh, he had a kind of mad magazine portrayal, this morph here of first a portrait of the king, and then a little bit sillier portrait, and then sillier, and then finally he looks like a pear. Which isn't the biggest amount of political criticism, you could say. Uh, but it does talk a lot about things like we have in America the First Amendment, right? This this freedom of speech. Uh, can the press make these critiques of our leaders? Which there are a lot of countries where you don't critique the leader. If, if you said, you know, hair president looks like a pear, like they could put you in prison and chop your head off. Like it's, it's a very serious deal to test this authority and, and how far freedoms can go. They did, in fact, take a little bit too far. Uh, here's this really cool kind of M.C. Escher drawing of uh, mixing the three faces of the past, the present, and the future. 
uh, in which at first the king's really happy with us, and then today he's a little sad, and soon he will be very angry. Which, he was very angry with Damier and some of his compatriots. They uh, ultimately ended up in political prison, and uh, more revolutions were going on through the 1800s. Uh, so, not quite as beneficial as it has been in Europe. 